Waking up to a really solid jobs report from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. An upside surprise on payrolls, yields climbing, equities lower. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. It's Jobs Day in America. The jobs report. This Friday's payroll report. The employment number. What we are going to watch is whether that unemployment rate ticks up. Everyone now is picking on the two E's, and that's employment and earnings. We're going to need to see a real deterioration in the labor market to, to really worry about a significant contraction. Employment is still quite strong out there. Good news is bad news. That just means the Fed could go 75. The economy is slowing, but the Fed wants it to slow. The labor market, you know, it's a lagging indicator. Obviously, payrolls report on Friday will, will be interesting. I don't think it's really this month necessarily or next month that we need to look out for. I still think it's a really tough and tight job market. It's two or three months from now or four months from now. This jobs report looks rock solid to me. Here's Mike McKee with more. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. It was much better than anyone expected coming in at 372,000 for the month of May and up uh, a, a little bit of a downgrade to April, uh, 384. Uh, for May, 384,000. The unemployment rate, 3.6 percent, unchanged. And the number that is going to catch the Fed's eye is average hourly earnings revised up in May to 0.4 percent and a 5.3 percent annual rate, but it comes down this month to 0.351. So we're seeing job growth without a lot of wage growth. Now, that may not be what they want to see in terms of the average person, but it does suggest that the inflation pressures are easy easing a little bit from this high job growth. Where the jobs are, professional and business services, 74,000, leisure and hospitality, 67,000, and healthcare always. But healthcare is also one of the lower paid categories. Retail and warehousing, I'm putting these together because we're seeing fewer people in stores, but more people in the Amazon kind of warehouses. It's almost one category right now. So where does that leave us? Well, I think, John, that this kind of diminishes the importance of the CPI report next week. We did have the decline of 74,000 in the prior two months, but as Peter Cheer put it in a note this morning, that's not in the market now. The market now is looking for where we are with inflation and growth. Inflation is strong enough and job growth is strong enough that the Fed can go 75, and it really doesn't matter what the CPI inflation rate is going to be. They're going to be locked into that 75, and the market's going to be back up there as well. Mike McKee, looking ahead to the Fed off the back of this payrolls report. Mike McKee, thank you. Looking ahead to July 13th, as well. That's next Wednesday, the CPI report. In our survey so far, the median estimate 8.8% on inflation in America. Here's the market story. Futures gap lower, then bounce back a little bit, down about a half of 1% on the S&P. Yields break out. And if I was going to pick one point on the curve right now for Treasuries, it's the two-year. The two-year out by about nine basis points, up three to 3.1%, 3 up nine basis points on the session and climbing through most of this week as well. That's a story with the market. Let's get to the panel. Joining us now is BlackRock's Rick Reader, Mohammed mm -hmm. Al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge. To the both of you, gents, it's been a while since we've both had you both on, so thank you very much. Mohammed, let's start with you, sir. Your reaction to that jobs number from 30 minutes ago. Well, like you said and Mike said, it is a strong report, but it has one disappointment, and I want to stress that. You know, it's great to see so many jobs created. It's great to see wage growth at 5%. It's great to see an unemployment rate at 3.6%. But we need labor force participation to go up. Labor force participation is to the labor market what higher productivity is to the economy as a whole. It can solve a lot of problems. And unfortunately, labor force participation came down, and that complicates mm -hmm. um, the takeaways from this job report. Rick, your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree with Mohammed. So I, I'm pretty surprised with the characterization. This is a solid report. It keeps the Fed moving. There's no ambiguity around that. It's strong enough. But I would I would modify a little bit of how strong this report. I mean, look at the household survey it was down over 300,000 jobs. There's something strange going on with the divergence between the payroll and the, and the household survey, the top line payroll numbers, in the household survey, because it's been the last three months. The household survey has been pretty soft. The other thing that, listen, I think you got to characterize as a strong report. But it's interesting if you go back and look at the Jolts report we got this week and you look at things 
which I study quite a bit, a couple of sectors, professional and business services was down over 300,000 job openings. Uh, manufacturing was down about 200,000 job openings. There is clearly a transition taking place. The first thing you do is you cut, you, you start freezing hiring. You start cutting those openings and you saw that in the in those cyclical places you saw that in a pretty profound way. So, you know, there's a question of solid report, household survey, curious why it's so soft relative to the other one, and things are evolving. And by the way, if you look at this is a stronger report, you look at the three month moving average versus the six month versus 12 month, it's no question it's slowing. It's just slowing as the Fed would like it, uh, but it's not, uh, and it, but it doesn't take them away from, they got to keep going and, and they'll keep going. Rick, that was going to be my follow-up. Are things slowing in the way that you anticipated? The last time you and I caught up last month, you turned around and you said this might be the last, the final big solid jobs report we get. 372 looked pretty solid to me, Rick. Your thoughts? So I, I had a feeling you made, so the first time I said, hey, I bet you remind me of that. <laughs> I, I, so I, uh, it, it, is, it, it is stronger than I thought it would be from that top line. Again, there's something funky going around, going on around. Why is the household survey creating this this sort of softness? Why are the openings? Whether you look at all the uh, ISM data around employment, I mean, it's pretty clear the employment numbers slowing pretty quickly. This was was a solid report. No ambiguity to it. It was more solid than I expect. I'm curious to see over coming months how the revisions take place. How you think about this, but it is definitely more solid than than I would have thought it would be. Mohammed, is there anything in the data, as far as the eye can see from your perspective, that you think gives this Fed pause for thought, makes them sit around, look around, and say we need to slow down? They won't get that from the CPI data. They won't get that from the jobs data. They would get it if they took a more holistic view of the economy. You you, you know what happened to orders in ISM. Um, but this Fed isn't stopping. This Fed is going to do 75 basis points and when it meets this month. And this Fed needs to catch up, John. They're not just reacting. They are catching up. And that's why they simply cannot wait. And 75 is the new 50 now, for now. Can we talk about how restrictive you think they need to get, Mohammed? reflecting on the minutes we've had earlier this week and folding that into the data from this morning? So I think they certainly are going to try to get to the restrictive level. I worry that on the way there, they may break something, and then you get the stop-go uh, phenomenon that would be the worst possible outcome for this economy. You, we need to get inflation out of the system. We really do. And we need to take advantage. We should have taken even more advantage last year of the strong economy, but we still need to take advantage of a strong labor market to get that done. Because otherwise, we will have both an inflation problem and a growth problem next year. Something you've said, Rick, and you've said a few times, they need to get to neutral first. Rick, are they anywhere near neutral <laughs> in, your, in your mind, from your perspective? So, so you get the 75 done in July, and then you get to about the number that would have been neutral, and like Mohammed says, you've got to go a bit past neutral. Listen, one man's opinion, I think they're going to go to 75. I think they'll get a 50 done in September. But I think we're going to get data over the over the coming months. And by the way, we've seen a lot in the last week and a half. You look at some of the, you know, the personal spending data. You look at some of the ISM data. You look at PMIs. Uh, and and by the way, Europe, the dynamics around Europe. I think you're seeing a number of characterizations, and we're going to see through earnings as well, of a of a significantly slowing economy. And Mohammed made one very critical point. We are watching things break along the way, whether it's the very levered structures that are coming under pressure, whether it's the refinancing in parts of real estate, resi, commercial, that are, that are starting to, uh, to, 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 uh, to crack a little bit. Listen, I, I do think that they're going to go the 75. I do think they're going to go 50. But then I think this thing is going to, they're going to have to slow down. And, and, I, and I think the data is going to corroborate that they're going to, uh, they're going to slow down. And like I say, we're seeing a bunch of evidence of that, of that in the numbers you've seen the last, last couple of weeks. So, Rick, are you becoming more risk averse or less? As this year progresses, less, less by by a good amount. And so, so I, uh, I know we've talked about on the show for a bunch. We've been running huge, like, you know, very high levels of cash for very long for a very long time. You know, you've gotten financial conditions. And one thing that the Fed has, been, has has certainly pressed on is getting financial conditions to levels that will be influencing in terms of inflation. And boy, these levels have moved. And, you know, we can talk about equities, which I still think are just OK. I can't find a lot of industries that I think are super cheap at these levels, not many at all. 
but you know the credit markets. You know, we started to 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 let the line out a little bit on some of that cash. You know, you get you think about if we're going to be run rate inflation over the next five to ten years. Let's say it's a bit higher, and it's let's say it's it's three ish, which is higher than the markets are pricing. You know, if you could buy high yield at nine, nine and a half, you could buy investment grade quality in the front to the to the medium part of the yield curve at five ish. Boy, that's a pretty good real rate. And so I would start with you own some more quality, you own more U.S. than Europe because Europe's going to have some duress around gas rationing, et cetera. But there's some there's some stuff to do now. I still think we're going to get more chances because the data is going to be going to be soft. I think over the coming weeks and months. But yeah, we're letting the line out a little bit, and um, and today doesn't dissuade us uh, from doing that. Although again, the Fed's certainly going to be more comfortable with moving over the next couple of uh, next couple of meetings. Mohammed, can I throw the same question at you? More or less risk averse as this year progresses? So I'm pre I've been pretty risk averse, as you know. Um, like Rick, I think there are some bargains out there. This is not a general statement. This is a very selective statement. Um, what would make me have a generally constructive view as opposed to a selectively constructive view one is inflation, if inflation proves not to be sticky. John, that's the major question you have to ask all your guests, is how sticky will inflation prove to be as the economy slows? And two is something you and I have talked a lot about, and Rick mentioned it, which is the market dynamics, the technicals, the liquidity, the dislocations. Um, you know, dislocations have a tendency to create contagion. That's great if you are defensively positioned, um, it's not so good if you are overweight risk assets. Mohammed, that's why I'll never let you sit in this seat, because you ask better questions than I do. And we've seen that in the past when you've tried to play anchor on this program. You did it just then. So, Mohammed, you can have the floor now. You've asked your own question. Answer it. How sticky do you think this is going to be? And what kind of numbers do you think we settle down at at the end of the year? So, John, I've learned from you. I'm going to give it to Rick. <laughs> Rick, you said that the economy will slow down. What happens to inflation? How sticky is inflation? How worried are you about the third and fourth round of Feds? Do I do I have somebody to pass this to? So so I would uh, <laughs> listen. I think it's going to be we're we're going through a deglobalization phenomenon that is real, and that means we're going to have higher levels of inflation that we've seen that we've seen in the past. And quite frankly, a slowing economy doesn't bring down the supply shocks created when, when you take 11 million barrels of liquids off the market through Russia. You don't you don't replace that and you know amount we've calculated it takes 1.2 million to get 1.2 million barrels of demand down you got to reduce get the unemployment rate up two percent that's an immense move meaning it's you're gonna have a sticky high energy you're gonna have a sticky high food inflation and shelters hard to bring down at the margin it's coming I mean it's coming down we think we think top line CPI is going to show over eight probably through September but then you know it's uh, you know you look at core PCE and the wedge and and that's coming down significantly. So it's coming down. But listen, you have to operate. This is part of why I think some of these markets that are giving you real rates above even elevated levels of inflation, you can get a bit comfortable with. But yeah, Mohammed, like Mohammed's right. When you deglobalize an economy, and you'll see companies that'll have to bring more regionalize their business, you have to you have your 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 hurdle rate on investment has to be reflective of that. Rick, Mohammed, sticking with us, equities down a half of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq 100 down a little more than 1%. We've talked about that move in the front end of the curve up 10 basis points on a two-year to 3.115% on a two-year yield right now. About 17 minutes away from the opening bell. Let's get you some movers. We can do that with Abby. John, will that move in yields on this jobs report that is perceived as perhaps inflationary or at least giving the Fed the green light to keep raising? We have, not surprisingly, tech lower. That explaining that underperformance for the Nasdaq 100 down more than 1%. Both Apple and Microsoft down about 1% or more earlier, down just slightly. So those fears around valuation and growth coming back into play. Twitter, of course, is down too, down 3.4%. That, but that probably, that underperformance has more to do with that recent report suggesting that Elon Musk's bid, uh, that potential deal is at risk. Three people saying the Musk camp is unable to verify the provided bot data. But one bright spot, of course, John, with yields rising, we do have Bank of America and some of the other big banks higher right now, up almost 1%. Abby, thank you. Coming up on this program with Rick and Mohammed, the Biden administration nearing a decision on tariffs on China. Tariffs are one tool, but we have other tools as well to make sure that we are protecting key sectors of the American economy and that we are um, holding to account for those. We'll catch up with AMH down in Washington, D.C. Up next.
There's no question that if you look at what the Chinese economy and the non-market practices that the Chinese, uh, the Chinese leadership are undertaking, that there are sectors of the economy where they are engaged in unacceptable activities and that those are, uh, present a strategic risk to our economy and our national security. Tariffs are one tool, but we have other tools as well to make sure that we are protecting key sectors of the American economy and that we are um, holding to account for those. President Biden set to discuss a potential pullback of U.S. tariffs on China. Tariffs on more than $300 billion in Chinese goods as the administration tries to curb surging prices. AMH joins us now from the White House. Anne-Marie, we've heard this for a while. How much closer are we? Well, he's having another meeting today with his close advisors, so it does seem, Jonathan, that he is inching very much more so closer than we were months ago when a lot of this we were discussing about whether or not he should lift some of those tariffs from the Trump era tariffs on China. The big issue in the administration, of course, is this is a debate between the foreign policy hawks on China and those that are trying to do anything when it comes to trying easing inflation. But I would say big picture, what you could see from the administration is that domestic policy goals, namely bringing inflation down, bringing down food prices, bringing down the cost of gasoline, has had this in administration shift some of their part foreign policy goals, like potentially lifting some of these Chinese tariffs, but also the president next week heading off to the kingdom. Important point. AMH in front of the White House. Anne-Marie, thank you. Mohammed and Rick still with us, I'm pleased to say. Mohammed, straight to you, sir. Can you have a credible forecast on inflation without a decent understanding of what is going to happen with the Chinese economy? Because the stop, start, stop, start there has confused me, and I imagine it's confused many others too. No, you're absolutely right. And, and let me tell you, John, I'm willing to put my neck out and say it is going to continue to be a problem. You cannot reconcile zero COVID policy with Omicron if you don't have the MNRA vaccines. So unless we see China change its vaccine policy, and then it will take time to vaccinate its population, we are going to see a continued attempt to have a zero COVID policy hit the reality of Omicron and result in shutdowns and disrupt supply chains. That's just almost, it's almost a done deal, John, given what this variant of COVID is like. It raises big questions about the credibility of the recent rotation we've seen in the equity market, Rick. Bank of America and Michael Hahn out this morning, highlighting that rotation from inflation commodities to deflation tech assets. Your thoughts on that? Rick, your response to it, just how credible is that rotation, this bounce we've seen <clears throat> in certain parts of this market? So I think, it, I mean, I, I think generically that's right. I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. Listen, energy's come off a lot. Materials have come off a lot. You know, it's a, so let's break it down. I mean, think of the metals market. I mean, things like copper, aluminum, prices have come down a lot. Those stocks have come down a lot. You know, there's some value, value there, but boy, it's, if the economy is going to be slow for a while those are pretty hard energy is pretty you know as per we just talked about energy is pretty well supported and will be for a while we've brought down some exposure in, in energy and uh, just because valuations have moved and you know relative to forward curves you know we think it was worth and uh, some crowding that's gone into that listen i think tech there's parts of tech you know do i think semis are still tricky if the growth is slow you know the oversupply there's an oversupply of semis particularly in some space so that's a tough area but software Companies in an inflationary world, companies are going to spend more on cloud and AI and software. I think those areas to move into and or to increase exposure there and parts of parts of big tech, that that I think is durable. And yeah. that that I think. And by the way, those valuations have become people trade them with interest rates. It's like yeah. crazy. I mean, top line top line revenue is you know 25 30 percent you get pretty comfortable with these multiples well i was going to say we're looking ahead to earnings season as well looking for those revenue numbers those earnings numbers mohammed many people have come on the show over the last few weeks and i know you've heard from the same people who have been surprised that we haven't had enough earnings revisions i've been surprised too i'm looking at the u.s dollar that's had something like a 10 percent rally since the end of q1 this year for the s p 500 i can only really think of one big multinational that's come out and said this is a big problem we need to basically pre-announced, and that was Microsoft. Mohammed, you factor in the potential for a recession in Europe. I'm not sure we can even say potential. Let's talk about reality. Have you been surprised by how much the earnings revisions have just remained pretty steady in certain places? Surprise, no, John. There's an inertia to them. You know that, right? It's very hard to revise down. And then once you start revising down, it becomes a herd behavior and it builds on itself. So I'm not sure whether we will be having this conversation in three months' time for the reasons you've cited. 
Um, you know, we've gone from a cost issue for corporate America, which you could pass on through higher prices, to a real question now as to whether your demand will hold. The focus is going to be much more on revenues. And the currency issue you raise just amplifies that for um, companies. So I suspect we will have quite an avalanche of revisions coming our way in the next three, three to six months. Rick, let's finish on that. Where are the revisions based on foreign exchange alone? And then that's just reality. We've got yeah. to adjust to that. How are we meant to adjust to that? So I'd say a couple of links. First of all, the last quarter, a lot of the earnings and it had come through. When you break it down, you saw units down, but you saw revenue in a pretty good spot because you were getting pricing power. What's starting to happen is you're getting the, the, the inability to pass through price. And that's where I think, and there's a lag to that. And I think you'll start to see that over the coming quarters. So I think the earnings in some areas will still be durably high when you break down places that you're still getting, certainly in, we talked about energy and other places, you know, where you can pass it through. But listen, I think there's a transition taking place. There's a real lag of, gosh, I got my revenues are good, and then, but my units are declining. It's certainly the rate of growth, if not actual descent. Yeah. And now it's, well, I can't get that pricing growth, so you're going to see some, some reduction. So listen, I think the earnings estimates out there are too high. And part of why I think equities are just OK. I think those have to come down. And, and I think you'll see that over, over subsequent quarters. But I think it'll be more erratic than people think. I think there'll be more dispersion because there's still companies. We see a lot of them, manufacturing companies we talk with. They're not seeing their backlog is still durable. Yeah. So I think it's more dispersion than it is a, a, a sheer devastation of earnings. I think they're down, but not that bad. Hey, Rick, awesome to catch up. Fantastic. Every single month after payrolls. And a special thanks to Mohammed, who was live texting me from the airport back to Cambridge to make sure that he could make this segment. So, Mohammed, just awesome, as always, sir, to the both of you. Thank you. Up next, your morning calls and later, Secretary Walsh from the White House. Here are your morning calls. JMP downgrading upstart, citing tighter funding and limited visibility. Wales downgrading iHeart Media, expecting an upcoming recession to hit radio hard. And finally, Wedbush cuts its price target on Twitter to 43 on uncertainty around its deal with Elon Musk. Up next, reaction to a solid payrolls report from the White House. It's Secretary Walsh and your opening bell next. Headline number delivers an upside surprise on payrolls Friday this morning. Good morning. Off the back of it, equities lower. Equity futures down a half of 1% on the Nasdaq after a really tidy week of gains on the Nasdaq 100. We're down about one full percentage point on the Russell. We're down by four tenths of 1%. The why? You'll find the why of the bond market. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Ten-year yields climbing higher. Two-year yields by a whole lot more. Up five basis points on a two-year. Up this morning by about 10 basis points, rather, on a 10-year. Up five basis points. The 3.043% on a two-year right now. We're back down to positive eight basis points. I'll get my numbers correct for you. Up to 3.1%. This idea that the Fed's going to have to do more, go 75 basis points at the end of this month, pushing equities back down again. In the FX market, euro dollar briefly breaking 101. Then bouncing back. Bit of resilience here after getting absolutely hammered over the last few months. Euro dollar 101.68 and crude 104.63. Output in America looks good based on that labor market report. And we've got a rally again on crude. About 40 seconds into this, let's get you some moves around the open. We can do that with Abby. John sticking with that stock and bond story. And of course, after that hotter than expected jobs report yields higher. Well, as you mentioned, that's pressing, pressing stocks lower, especially big tech. Microsoft being one of uh, the big culprits on the day, down 1.4%. Of course, rising yields bring into concern valuation. Twitter underperforming on that theme as well. But it also has to do with that Washington Post report uh, saying that the deal, Elon Musk's potential deal to buy Twitter uh, is at risk based on the fact that they may not be able to verify the company's bot 
information. On the upside, though, in one of the few sectors that's higher, Occidental Petroleum up 2% as oil sticks around $105 per barrel. And the same deal for banks. Banks are another one of the up sectors. J.P. Morgan up about three-tenths of 1%, getting a little bit of a lift from those rising yields. Abby, thank you. You mentioned that Twitter deal, so let's talk about it. The stock is down about 4%. Here's the quote from the Washington Post story that Abby referenced. Here it is. It's in serious jeopardy. Musk's team concludes Twitter's figures on spam accounts are not verifiable. Musk is going to deliver a speech from Sun Valley tomorrow. Our man is there right now. Let's get to Ed Ludlow for more. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, John. The spread on the deal is at its widest point since mid-June, around $17 between the $54.20 offer price and where we're currently trading. The timing of that Washington Post story, very interesting, because you'll remember yesterday morning, Twitter executives briefed that the number of users on the platform that are bots are less than 5%. They said that the methodology and data was not verifiable by a third party, but that they used a mix of private and public data and that they could verify it. Then you had the Washington Post story come out, and that's really what it's about. According to anonymous sources, the Musk camp does not think that it's, ver uh, that it's verifiable. What's also interesting about that reporting, John, is that they say Musk has stopped talking with at least one potential equity partner on the financing side. I find that interesting because reports had been that Musk was talking with many potential equity partners. So if he stopped talking with one, it's hard to draw an inference from that. Musk arrived to Sun Valley Yesterday evening, sources tell me, he snuck through the back door. We haven't laid eyes on him yet, but he's here and he's going to speak Saturday. And my understanding is that he will address this issue. Not major news for this market that sniffed this out quite a while ago. Ed Ludlow, thank you on the latest. Looking forward to that speech and your coverage of it. The stock's down by about 4%. Where are we? 37 handle. Agreed price was 54.20. I can't remember the last time we were anywhere near that agreed price on Twitter. Right now, 37. Let's call it 37.30. That's the story for Twitter. Here's the story for the broader equity market about three minutes in. Stocks lower by four tenths of 1%. On the S&P, on the Nasdaq, down about eight tenths of 1%. Michael Hartnett of Bank of America always puts out his note on a Friday morning. I always enjoy reading it. Here's a snippet of it for you. It's a summer narrative of second half recession and 23 Fed rate cuts and a big rotation from inflation commodities to deflation tech assets. Let's get to Kaylee Lines for more. Hi, Kaylee. Hey, John. The basic idea here is that rates are going to go up, growth is going to go down. So then where do investors go? The answer seems to be cash. At least that's what we saw over the week ended Wednesday. When you take a look at flow, $63 billion flooding into cash or in some sense getting out of other assets. Now, the money also is going into bonds, $2.4 billion worth of inflows there globally. So that does signal that desire for safe haven. But then look, equity outflows, $4.6 billion. So what does that signal about the trajectory of this market? Well, Hartnett says we're going to be range bound that will trade between 38 and 4,200 basically through the summer rather than seeing a continued rebound. And it's worth noting we've already been in that range really for the last two months. He goes on to say that the bear market isn't over and the big low has yet to be reached on the surface level. Beneath the surface of the index, he talks about that rotation you uh, just mentioned there, John, out of commodities plays into plays like technology as the narrative shifts from one of inflation to one of deflation. And we certainly have seen that reflected in commodities prices themselves across the ags, the metals, even oil, those prices coming down. It helps explain why energy, after being far and away the outperformer in the first half, a week into the second half, it's the worst performer on a sector basis, John. Kelly Knight, thank you very much. All responding to this payrolls report, this equity market shifts lower, yields break out. And there's a broad consensus off the back of it that this Fed is going to 75. Here's Black Rock's Jeff Rosenberg. The lack of payroll uh, slowing here and the lack of an increase in participation is just, again, highlighting the pressures on the Fed here that you have uh, an overheating economy and they need to really push on the demand side. And so you're seeing the reaction in the front end, uh, you know, reflective of that. The perfect panel on fixed income right now. P. Jim's Mike Collins, Sok Jen, Sabajra Rajapa. Sok Jen, Sabajra Rajapa, do you agree that we're going 75 at the end of this month all over again? Yeah, most likely, given the fact that we've had a very strong payroll print and there's no uh, reason to believe that the inflation uh, print that's due in the middle of next week is going to be any different. So the Fed is, uh, has stated very clearly that they're keen to... Uh, front load rate hikes. We've heard from a few Fed speakers, Waller, Bullard, and, and, and others who are in favor of a 75 basis point rate hike. So this is the perfect opportunity for the Fed 
to be able to deliver that 75 basis point rate hike and deliver as many hikes as they can between now and September, uh, and then perhaps think about uh, slowing down the pace of hikes after that. And then when did they pause? So, Bantra, this keeps coming up. 75 looks now done. As you point out, this summer, they'll keep going. It's the what next of it. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank this morning told us on Bloomberg Surveillance they get to 4%. Do you share that confidence, conviction they get to 4%? I don't. I think that what uh, what happens is that they probably get to, uh, you know, three to three and a quarter percent in a, in a rush, and then take a much more measured approach on rate hikes. Because I don't really see any point in trying to raise rates all the way up to four percent or beyond, and then have to cut very uh, soon thereafter if the economy starts to slow down. So why not take a much more measured approach? You know, get rates up to maybe three, three and a quarter percent, and then pause, see how uh, financial conditions evolve. See how the economy is doing, and then uh, think about raising rates uh, if, if the economy still holds up. That tees you up, Mike Collins. Question one: 75 at the end of this month. That's the easy one. Question two: Can they get Fed funds to four percent? Yeah, I mean, definitely 75. I think is is in the cards, right? And I think this gives them the 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 opening to do that for sure, Jonathan. So uh, check that box, and then then I'm taking the under on the four percent for sure. I mean, the markets are pricing in. Uh, three and a half right now. So that's kind of your over under. So the question is, do, you know, where do you go from there? I, I think I'll still take even the under uh, on the three and a half, right? If they do 75 in two weeks from now, remember the September meeting isn't for almost two and a half months from now. A lot can change between now and then. Uh, so, so maybe they do 50 or 75. They're already kind of close to three around that point. Maybe they get another hike or two in, but but I think that the data is going to start decelerating pretty quickly uh, before they even get to three and a half. So you're confident, Mike, we've seen the high, the peak on a 10-year yield. I've asked that question a few times this week. The answer I've actually got multiple times is yes. Do you share that view? Yeah, I, I do, Jonathan. I, I, I don't know if I would say it with a, with 100 percent confidence, but I but I think, you know, three and a half, you know, above that on the 10 years, kind of a high water mark for the markets. I mean, the markets were pricing in just a few weeks ago, a month ago, a 4% terminal funds rate. And, and I felt then that that was clearly a peak in terms of Fed rate hike expectations. So, so I think we've kind of passed that peak. And, you know, when the curve inverts like it has and like it is today, Jonathan, typically that's not a signal to go into cash. It's a signal to start extending duration. So, Badra, your view? No, I completely agree with Mike. I think that you know the, the curve inversion is something that uh, is is a concern for me. The yield curve is going to continue to to, to flatten as, as the Fed uh, remains pegged on its path towards higher uh, policy rates going forward. But the one thing that we're not really paying attention to is the balance sheet runoff. It's just starting to get underway. So you know, if you think about it, by the time September rolls around, we're going to be the Fed's going to be rolling off uh, you know Fed close to 100 billion every month. Is going to be rolling off the Fed's balance sheet. So you're going to see tightening uh, coming from the balance sheet side of the equation as well as uh, the interest rate uh, hikes being delivered. So after September, a measured approach uh, for policy uh, definitely makes sense, especially given the fact that the yield curve is, is starting to flatten and that's going to start signaling a meaningful slowdown in growth in the next 12 to 18 months. So, Bajra Japa sticking with us alongside. Mike Collins, as we work our way through some of this data in just a moment, we'll catch up with Secretary Walsh from the White House off the back of a decent payrolls report. 372, nice upside surprise on payrolls, delivering some gains in, into equities, you would hope, but that's not how the story works here at all. It's a good news, bad news story because it's yields higher, equities lower. On the S&P 500, we break down a little bit on the Nasdaq a whole lot more. Looking at Treasuries this morning, yields higher by eight or nine basis points on a two year to 3.1% on a 10-year, up six basis points right now to about 3.052% going into the Fed later this month. From New York City on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio, I'm Jonathan Ferrer. I'm very pleased to say that we are going to be joined by Secretary Walsh in just a moment. I want to take the opportunity to troll back Tom Keane, who's been trolling me all morning, because I know he can hear me in the radio booth now. Just so you know, Tom messages me every other minute when the market gets open to give me Dow quotes. Tom Keane tells me we're down 44. So thank you, Tom, for sharing that with me. I'll do credit spreads a little bit later. Secretary Walsh, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Secretary, great to catch up with you, sir. Really decent payrolls report in the view of so many people. Your perspective, please, sir, first of all. Yeah. 
No, it was a good report. I think the, the couple things that, that I'm very happy to see in the private sector, uh, we're seeing uh, employment back to pre-pandemic levels. In the manufacturing sector, same thing. Uh, in the childcare sector, for the first time, quite honestly, in a little bit, we've seen some gains, which means that our childcare facilities are getting a little bit back to, I wouldn't call them back to where they were pre-pandemic, but we're seeing some growth there. Warehousing and obviously manufacturing, we've seen some great growth there as well. So we're seeing uh, our job economy moving flo forward. Uh, the, the wage growth, we're seeing the, the biggest, well, some of the biggest gain in the lowest income earners, which is good. Obviously, we're still dealing with inflation, and, and the, the wage growth isn't quite keeping up with inflation. But I think what we want to do is actually bring inflation down. Uh, so we, we have to continue to move forward. But uh, this, is, this shows that where the country, is, is with President Biden laying out the plans when he took office, is still moving forward on the job side. But as you just mentioned, there's still a lot of unanswered questions about the economy. It's still kind of in, in a very you know, interesting place. Secretary Walsh, I've relied on you over the last few months to give me updates on what's happening on the West Coast. I understand the contract with the West Coast Port Union expired and talks are ongoing. You've said a few times on this program that you're not concerned. Are you concerned now? No, I'm not concerned because both sides, both parties put a statement out, two statements now, letting people know that they're going to continue negotiations when the contract expires July 1st. Uh, I've spoken, I didn't speak to them this week, I spoke to both sides last week. Uh, they both said it's moving in, in the right direction, both sides, I should say, the unions and the companies. Uh, and, and obviously we haven't had that issue yet that might pop up that will cause a little indigestion for, for both sides. But I, I like the, where it's going. You know, the interesting thing about this negotiation, it doesn't start until six weeks prior to the expiration of the contract. And that's one of the things that, you know, a little different than most contracts. Some contracts you can start negotiation at six months prior to expiring. But, but I feel good where we're going. I know there's a lot at stake. Clearly, we don't want to have any issues like we did last holiday season and last fall. Uh, with, with, with boats out in the, with, with ships out in the harbor and not getting supplies in. So I do feel good where we are at, at today's, during today. Secretary Walsh, as you know, this is a really important topic, and I can take your word for it that you feel good, but other members of the audience might not. Can you help them understand what's at stake here and the details of the negotiations? What's stopping this one from closing? What's the gap? How big's the gap? And what's it over? Yeah, so just so everyone understands, when, you, when they do the negotiations on the port, uh, they generally go on for long periods of time. And, and historically, uh, under I think 2014, uh, it went on for a long time. There was no strikes or slowdowns or lockouts. But what we want to do right now, in the time that we're living in, making sure that people's pressure, they feel the pressure, price pressures at home, they're paying for goods and services, where they're seeing inflation obviously impacting their families. We want to make, I want to make sure, and President Biden wants to make sure that we don't have a breakdown in negotiation at the port to add additionally to inflation, additionally to cost. And that's, that's what's at stake, quite honestly. And what, what the contract that they're negotiating is everything from wages to working conditions to everything that you can imagine. So it's a massive contract. There are tens of thousands of, of workers. There are nine shipping companies involved in this, in this negotiation. So it is, it's a very long negotiation. Well, I shouldn't say long. It's a very, very challenging negotiation at the table. But when, when I hear from both sides the same exact thing, that it's moving along, I'm, I'm pleased with that. Uh, I'm not concerned about the contract expiring last on the first of this month. Sure. Uh, certainly, next month I come on this show, if we don't have a contract and we're not close to a contract, then you and I might be having a very different conversation. But right now I feel good. Well, let's talk about that. As you know, you can't take their word for it either. Are you preparing for the possibility of a strike? Can you continue to talk to me about what those preparations look like? Yeah, I'm really, honestly, I'm really not concerned about strike. The last time there was a strike at the ports of L.A. and Long Beach, it was in 1972, I believe. Uh, so we haven't had a strike there in quite some time. And the way I look at this, these workers and these shipping companies and these suppliers and everyone working at the port, particularly the workers, They've lived through and worked through a pandemic like a lot of us have. They went to work every day. They were still unloading ships. The, the, the supply chain issues or the shortages at the, at the ports weren't necessarily because they weren't unloading the ships. It was because the manufacturing stopped in China. They, they shut down manufacturing just like they did earlier this year. So workers want to go to work. If workers yep. don't work, they don't get paid. They're not a salaried bunch of people. If they don't work the hours, they don't get paid. They're hourly workers. And that's why for them, it, it, there's an interest for the, for the people that work on the ports to make sure this contract gets resolved and they continue to work. Secretary Walsh, just quickly and briefly, and I respect your time, and I just want to squeeze this in. You mentioned China. The president, we understand, will be meeting with advisors today to consider removing tariffs on China. We've been told many times over the last few years from the previous administration and this one that a lot of this is about fairness and also protecting American jobs. Do you have a seat at the table in that conversation? 
No, I'm not necessarily at the table. I've been involved in some conversations, and I think that, you know, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen today at the White well, what's House. What's your view on it? What have you said back to them? I mean, I, I, th I think, you know, it's, it's above my pay grade as far as where I am right now. But I think that, you know, I think having this conversation is really important because we're thinking about the pressures of, of, of inflation. But we're also going to keep an eye on the jobs that are here in the United States. And the president has certainly laid out in the beginning of his presidency a big opportunity to create more opportunities in manufacturing in the United States of America. One thing that's indirectly related, the, the Bipartisan Innovation Act that's in front of Congress right now, that's an important piece of legislation to pass because yeah. that would allow us the opportunity to build more in America and have more products built in America. Some of what we're seeing right now in America is the computer chips that are in all of our, our phones and our doorbells and, and we're, we're doing it right now on TV. Um, we should be making those the United States of America. That's an opportunity for us to help relieve long-term inflationary pressures down the road. Next time we're in Washington, D.C., Tom Keaton and I would love to catch up with you, Secretary. It's great to catch up with you now. Secretary Walsh there from outside the White House. Coming up, earnings guidance souring the most since 2019. It looks like we're going to have an earnings drop next year. And uh, I don't think that that's going to be reflected so much in second quarter EPS. It won't be a, a quarter of big up upward surprises. That conversation up next. This Fed isn't stopping. This Fed is going to do 75 basis points, and when it meets this month. And this Fed needs to catch up, John. They're not just reacting, they are catching up. And that's why they simply cannot wait. And 75 is the new 50 now, for now. 75 is the new 50 for now. Let's get a final word from our panel on fixed income, the brilliant Mike Collins and wonderful Sabatra Rajapa. Mike Collins, you said you think we've seen the high on a 10-year yield. I've asked this question many times alongside that question. Have we seen the wides on high yield spreads? Uh, that's, a, that's a tougher one, right, John? Right now, at high-yield spreads are bouncing around close to 600 basis points, or at least they, uh, they hit that uh, a week or so ago. And I think what that's pricing in is uh, a mild recession. Right. So if you think we're going to have a mild recession, and I think we are. Right? I think that's a foregone conclusion. You're going to have a few quarters of negative real GDP over the next year. You're going to have earnings continue to come down, maybe even some earnings contraction and declines. You're going to have defaults increase a little bit. That's priced in. Everybody knows that. What's not priced in is a deep recession, a big decline in earnings, and a big increase in defaults. And I don't think that that's necessarily in the cards. So I think you're, you're seeing value here. But of course, if that recession risk gets worse, uh, spreads could certainly widen from here. So, Badger, you get the final word. Looking ahead to CPI next week, 8.8% in our survey right now. So, Badger, what are you and the team at SOCGEN looking for next week? Yeah, no, I think that next next week's number it's a, almost a foregone conclusion. It's going to be in and around consensus, and even if it's if it's uh, you know slightly lower, it's not really going to change the trajectory for the Fed um, for the the July meeting. So I think 75 basis points is pretty much uh, you know baked in the cards. The question really for me is sort of the, the details of the report. If we start seeing any parts of of the report starting to show signs of of inflation pressures starting to ease. Uh, I think we, you've had this discussion earlier on in your program where, you know, which sectors are, are sticky and which, which sectors are not. You are going to see perhaps some signs of demand destruction, uh, some signs that consumers actually retrenching. And yeah. those are the data points that I'd be looking uh, closely towards. It's about Rajapa, Mike Collins, to the both of you, fantastic. As always, thank you. Just got a message on the Bloomberg from the cheap seats in the back. No way of high yield spreads peaked and no a recession. Any kind of recession is definitely not priced in. The view of someone, a Bloomberg subscriber whose name I won't share right now. Coming up your training diary from New York. This is Bloomberg.
A rock solid jobs report yields up, stocks down, and a chorus of guests on this program looking for a 75 basis point rate hike from the Federal Reserve month end. Stocks down seven tenths of one percent. Here's your trading diary. We'll hear from the New York Fed President John Williams, 11 Eastern, President Biden, 11:30. The big banks kicking off earnings next week with Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan on deck. Biden's heading to the Middle East on Wednesday. We'll get the latest read on inflation with US CPI shortly after that. From New York this morning, good morning. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.